no, I don't want to have the windows that close to my speaker. Uh, yes, you do. Actually, they're they're completely out of the tweeter path of the speaker. When they're behind the speaker, that's the absolute best place for a window to be. Tell me if this sounds familiar. So you just wrapped up filming or recording in your home office, home studio, a spare bedroom, the basement, a YouTube creation space, content creation space, podcast creation space. You get back to your computer, plug everything in and find out something's wrong with the audio. Maybe it's hollow, maybe it's echoey, maybe it's really dark or boomy, uh, maybe it's harsh. And you're like, oh, clearly it's finally time for a new microphone. This is crazy, right? So you pull it up on YouTube, best microphone for content creation, best microphone for YouTube, best micro All of the best, most recommended options are hundreds if not thousands of dollars and you're like, this can't be, I just can't. I, All right, I, stop I, panicking. A better, more expensive microphone might actually be hurting you instead of helping you. And in this video, we're gonna find out why that is, why a better, more expensive microphone might actually be making your sound worse and what you can do instead. Stay tuned. So my name is Brian Miller. I'm a former professional magician. That's right, I said magician. I was a corporate and high-end event entertainer. Traveled the world, it was a lot of fun. Then I gave a tiny little TEDx talk that went viral. It launched me into a career as a writer, author, speaker, consultant. But before any of that, I actually have a background in audio engineering. And what happens to people in audio is a very similar problem to what happens in video. See, if you're a new video creator and you're struggling to get an image that you're really happy with, your instinct, like mine was at the beginning of my video days, was to get a better camera, thinking a better camera will provide a better image, which is technically true, but 98% of the time, you would be better served with lighting. A $10,000 camera in a poorly lit room will look like a $10,000 camera in a poorly lit room. Similarly, in audio, most of the time people think it's the microphone, that they don't have a good enough microphone, when in fact it's their room. And if you buy a better, more expensive microphone, you'll make the problem worse because if your room is echoey, a better microphone, a high-end microphone, will more accurately represent that echoey room. By using a cheaper microphone, if you don't have a good environment to record or film in, you're actually helping to mask the poor sound of your room because a low quality microphone isn't really capturing the room. Still, uh, getting a crappy microphone to mask your crappy sounding room isn't really a long-term solution. And if you're looking to be a really top-notch content creator, whether it's for video or for audio, like podcast, narration, voiceover, you really do want to make sure your room is a fantastic acoustic environment. We're gonna be taking a look at how some relatively basic acoustic treatment can make a huge impact on your recordings. This video is the second in a series of videos sponsored by and produced in collaboration with GIK Acoustics. GIK Acoustics is a leader in sound absorption and acoustic treatment for professional studios, but increasingly for home users, home studios, content creators. If you have not seen part one of this series, I highly recommend you go there right now. I show you how I took this room, which is, uh, this is a new house we just moved into about eight or nine months ago, and I just transformed the spare bedroom from a relatively normal home office that a content creator might be in to a phenomenal acoustic treated environment with virtually no reflections, no echo, and a balanced tone across the board. In the first video, I showed you the physical build out of all 11 pieces of acoustic treatment that went into this room. Two giant bass traps in the corners, uh, two more bass traps with scatter plates with a beautiful design, all the colors, everything custom that I got to pick out, which you would get to pick out as well if you worked with uh, uh, GIK Acoustics. Uh, behind me here, behind the studio monitors, these two bass traps with scatter plates, these two full range broadband acoustic uh, absorption panels here, and there's one on the ceiling right above me that you can't see. So there are actually 11 pieces of treatment in this room, and the before and after is night and day. Hey, Brian Miller here, author, speaker, magician, podcast host, and audio nerd. 
Hey, Brian Miller here, author, speaker, magician, podcast host, and audio nerd. And the third video will have all of those before and after sound samples. But in this video, I want to give you a really good understanding of what all these different types of sound absorption panels, these acoustic treatment panels do. When you work with them, you're not just on your own. For free, you can go on their website, you can go to the room planning section, and you can actually use a 3D visualization software to design your exact room with your exact dimensions, how thick the walls are, how tall the ceilings are, where the windows are, where the doors are, put uh, your desk, your equipment, your couches into the room and then send that off to GIK Acoustics and a room planner will take a look at it and then make various recommendations for you based on your budget and what you're looking to do in that room. So they will guide you for free along the whole process of what would be the best sound treatment for your space and your needs. So as we treat a room, we're looking, first, first step is to get the bass resonances in check. Uh, you want to think of your room as a Coke bottle, uh, more or less. So like you, you blow against a Coke bottle, it's going to produce a note. That's the resonance of the Coke bottle. Um, your room is a huge Coke bottle. And if you had a mouth big enough to blow on the door, it would make a note. Um, so what we want to do is deploy, deploy bass traps around the room, ideally in, in the most ideal locations, corners, back wall. Um, you know, sometimes there's a door in the corner. It's fine. You know, your room's not crap now. I, I have a door in two corners, which I know was part of probably what you were staring at when you had to figure out what to do with this. That's part of it. You know, and, it, and people will be like, what do I do? What do I do? I can't hit the corners. It's like, well, no, I mean, you just, you kind of want to put bass traps everywhere. Literally. I mean, if it's a pro studio, there's, there's bass traps on literally every surface. You just can't see most of them because they're behind something prettier. Uh, but they're, they're there, uh, two, three feet thick in a lot of cases. We want to put bass traps everywhere. But if we do it purely with broadband, we're, we're exponentially killing the top end of the room at a much higher rate. So we're, we're getting the room out of balance. I've got all these bass traps to get the low end resonances down. But what I've done in the meantime is I've just nuked the top end. The, the goal of any room uh, should be even decay. You want 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz and everything in between. You want it all to decay at the same rate. You know, least amount of money for the biggest impact, because there's always a lot of diminishing returns, right? The more you do, the, the more it takes to do a little bit. So at the very beginning, even a little bit can be a lot, right? So where do they start? Where does someone start in their, in their room? Uh, the fundamentals of how you set your desk up and where your chair is and where your speakers are. That's free. Yeah, stay out of the corner as best possible. You want to have symmetry on the wall in front of you and to, the, to your sides so that the area around the speakers should be as symmetrical as possible. Um, when you've got, say, a left speaker that's tight to the wall and the right speaker has got a lot of space on the other side, you're going to get a really weird phantom image phantom center image because of that relationship between those two different boundaries. You want to avoid sitting in the dead center of the room in terms of the length of the room. Avoid untreatable reflective surfaces that are within the tweeter path of the, of the speakers. So what I mean by that is a lot of people will be reticent about setting their setup in front of a window. Oh, I don't want to have the windows that close to my speaker. Yes, you do. Actually, they're they're completely out of the tweeter path of the speaker when they're behind the speaker. That's the absolute best place for a window to be in a room because it's going to be reflective. And if the tweeter doesn't point at it, that's where I want it to be. The other aspect of the window behind the speakers is that a, a window is in a quasi sense of free bass trap. It's going to be flimsier than a wall. So if bass can get through the window, then that's bass that I don't have to trap because that bass got away. Kind of a free bass trap. Uh, again, that's going to depend on how good of a quality a window it is. You know, the, the more sound can leak out of it, the more it behaves as a bass trap. Um, if it is going to be a bedroom, uh, you know, I'll, I'll put the bed behind me. Um, it's not a bass trap, but it absorbs stuff. And that's really where I think somebody should start if they are on a budget is some actual bass traps. As a mix engineer, the, the number one thing that we struggle with is low-end translation. Sounds great here, 
I go listen to it at my buddy's house and it's either anemic or boomy. Um, why? Well, because your, your listening environment hasn't, you haven't addressed the resonance of your Coke bottle. So that's what you want to get in check first. If your focus is vocal production and vocal recording, I would go with the carpet. High frequency reflections when you're, when you're trying to track a vocal for voiceover work or for singing or whatever, it's a nightmare. You got to get rid of that stuff. And Carpeting is a good, cheap way to do that. If we're talking about a room where it's going to be more dedicated to audio listening, mixing, mastering, whatever that is in that context, if that's the focus of the room, I'd lean a little more towards hard hard surface floors, again, because we're, we're trying to gain a balance. And if I, if I have so much of the percentage of the room that is dedicated to high frequency absorption, that just means I'm going to need a lot more bubbles and a lot more uh, digi waves to, to offset what I've already done on the floor to get that balance back. That kind of answered two questions at once. So these bass traps that we talked about earlier, these are big, thick bass traps that are going to go, uh, uh, two of them basically going straight up the wall, covering this, these entire corners here, these, uh, these charcoal gray ones. Two of these beautiful uh, impression panels. So are these going to be killing some of the low end but letting some of the high end scatter back whereas the right whereas the base traps are just going to kill the low end in the corners right the bubbles uh impression panel that you have behind you that's going to because of the different sizes of the webbing of wood in between the the circular absorption areas those different webbings of wood are going to scatter different frequency content because the size of that wood between the bubbles is varied. The, the digi wave on your right, you know, the majority of the middle of that is going to be scattering very similar frequency content. But because we have some variation on the, on the top and bottom of it in terms of the size of that wood webbing, you're going to be getting some more interesting scattering because of that portion of the design. The two two by two uh, bass traps with the digi wave that are going to go directly behind the monitors. So, what was the choice to do bass traps behind the monitors? You know, I often see a, a room. They'll send me photos of the room, and they've got like the the thin foam up on the front wall behind their speakers. And really, that's that's going to be a not a very high frequency critical area of the room. If you think about the way your speakers are pointing, not pointing at that wall, certainly they're pointing at like basically every wall but that wall. So the area behind the speakers is going to be a very bass focused region. It's nice to get some scattering of some high frequencies coming back at you just so you don't feel like you're talking into a cocoon all the time. That scatter is going to be on the on the negative polarity side of, of your microphone. So it, it's not affecting the quality of your recording, but what it is doing is just giving you some room cues as you sit there and talk so it doesn't be, you know, so fatiguing. You know, frankly, on a budget, you know, you, you want you want the panels to be able to work in different ways. And if if they're if they're allocated to first reflections on your sidewalls there, then that's all they're going to do. But if I can take them and form a V and you know seat them right behind you when you're playing an acoustic guitar, um, you know, you're gonna get some better recording uh capabilities out of them too. They're the, they become more of a Swiss army knife where you can move them around the room and do different things around the room. I think the biggest misconception is that it can be too dead. There, there's a lot of people out there talking about how their room feels dead and they want to add diffusion to make it not so dead. Dead is good. You know, when you, when you want an unadulterated response of what your speakers are telling you. Dead is good. It can be fatiguing for sure. You know, you spend a lot of time in a room that's dead. It's it, your ears just kind of start to feel compressed a little bit. You know, that's more the role of diffusion in my book. I mean, there, there's more highbrow applications to it that, that we can get into for sure. But a big misconception too, is that diffusers are going to make a small room sound big. They're not. I mean, the biggest your room is ever going to sound is when it's naked. 
the more you add to the topology of the room, whether that's absorption or diffusion, you're, you're shrinking the, the, the acoustic size, if anything. Well, that's it for this video. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope it was really useful. Comment below on the bits that you found most interesting, most useful stuff that you thought you knew that it turns out you didn't know. I know there was definitely some stuff that John taught me that I uh, I had either never heard, never heard of before or had completely backwards in spite of how much I thought I knew about audio. So thank you again to John and everybody at GIK Acoustics. Stay tuned. Uh, ding the notification bell so that you find out when part three shows up in a couple of days with all of the before and after sound samples from this studio transformation. Anyway, I'm Brian Miller. Thanks so much for tuning in and always remember that our world is a shared experience. Have a great day. But I need to find, do I, do those need to go into some beam in the nope. ceiling? No, the, the there's toggle bolt in the hardware kit where. Okay. Great. You familiar with toggle bolts? I do tons of to everything, yeah. I've gotten really good at toggle bolts over the years because- I mean, I had to explain a shim, so I wasn't sure <laughs> if I had to explain a toggle bolt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm walking out of this interview. Um, <laughs> it's my interview. Uh, <laughs>